the topic of the day today is can the evolution of life on Earth be explained by purely natural processes? I will, as you probably have guessed, say yes. Paul Nelson will try to say no. The debate will be raised some philosophical issues. What is an explanation? What are purely natural processes? And also the same and scientific issue. What is our best explanation of the patterns and history of living forms on Earth? We will begin, as always, with a bottle of beer. <laughs> the slide that you have up there is, is one in which you see an advertisement for a beer created by a brewery in Utah. Now, you wonder why a brewery would go and name its beer after a scientific theory, but it drives home that we are operating in a strange political context. This debate is not about the politics of evolution, but nevertheless, there is a political context because of which a debate such as this is occurring at all. The context is not for free speech or inquiry, rather the context has been set by the assault on high school biology curricula by creationists. We are debating creationists now as evolutionary biologists primarily because of that, not because we think that the science itself requires public defense. We do not debate flat earthers. We do not see us debating radians. But that's because flat earthers and radians don't threaten the integrity of children's education whereas the creationists do, and that is why we have to debate them. The first thing I want to warn people here, the new kind of creationism that you're going to see here, the reformed creationism that, that I like to call it, is called its sort of intelligent design, is quite more sophisticated than the young, younger creationism that you see represented by the book over there, Noah's Ark, a feasibility study. The new creationism is being peddled by politically throughout organizations, in particular the Discovery Institute, and it's funded, it's funded very well by individuals such as Howard A. A. Amundsen, who wants to replace U.S. democracy by a theocracy. That's the political context because of which we have the debate today. And as I move on now to more scientific issues, I would like all of you to remember that that context is important and remains in the background. So what is our best explanation of patterns and history of living processes on Earth? As you probably expect, I am going to come out and say that it is the theory of evolution and it has been around since 1858, since Darwin and Wallace suggested that evolution by natural selection can explain the origin of species and the variation in the organisms that you see around in the world. What the theory of natural selection did was provide an account of function, provide an account that showed how purpose so that activities on the part of animals, plants, and their parts can be seen in nature, and a whole, how all of this can be done without attributing any teleology to nature itself. And thus, it brought the study of all living processes into the realm of natural science. The theory of evolution we have today owes a lot to Darwin and Wallace, but that's not all that there is to it. The 20th century saw a massive development of the theory. Most of the important work that came in the 1920s and 1930s were due to three geneticists, J.P.S. Haldane, Sewell Wright, and Ronald Fisher, who used Mendelian genetics and the theory of natural selection to forge together what we consider to be the modern theory of evolution. Molecular data that, collected, that was collected starting in the 1950s and 1960s has gone on to verify that theory and fine tune many of the models of evolutionary change. So, what is the theory and what is the form of the theory that we should be willing to defend against all these? The first and most important part of it is that the way in which we explain the patterns of life that we see on Earth is through descent with modification. All extant living organisms are descended from one or very few ancient lines. That's why almost all organisms have the same genetic code. Variation and modification are going to occur through natural processes alone. And the natural there is highlighted because I will come back later to say what exactly that means. Natural selection is an important source of modification. Other mechanisms of change are also permitted. And within evolutionary biology, there can be a debate as to how important natural selection is compared to the other causes of evolutionary change. Strictly speaking, from this point of view, the origin of life is not a question that must be answered within evolutionary theory. Though most biologists, including me, would say that the origin of life is also explained through all these natural processes. Now, the first point I want to point out is that, that this theory, the modern theory of evolution, has gone through systematic scientific debate within the biological community. There have been many, 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 many controversies within it. For example, in the 1970s, there was a controversy as to whether evolution at the molecular level is better explained by neutral changes or whether it's explained by natural selection. 
All of these things have been dealt with within the theory, and the theory we accept today is the one we accept because it is the best explanation we can come up with for the facts around us. Contrary to the creationists, evolution is not treated as a dogma by biologists. We believe in evolution simply because that's what the evidence forces us, and that's a point that's important as we go through the history of this debate. In order to drive the point home, I want to draw an analogy between the theory of evolution at this point and the Copernican theory, since this is an example that traditionally creationists have used against us. So when we say that the Copernican theory is true, what we essentially mean is that planets move around the sun, and it's not true that the planets and the sun moves around the earth. It's irrelevant to the truth of that statement that Copernicus's exact claim that the planets moved in exact circles around the sun was false, that it originally had to be replaced with Kepler's law, which replaced the circles with, with ellipses, and then at the turn of the last century, or, or slightly to the last century, it had to be replaced with a different theory of gravitation due to Einstein. Now these make Kepler, the Copernican theory false. Similarly, in the case of evolution, the crucial thing is descent with modification due to natural causes. As it was irrelevant that Darwin himself had a wrong theory of heredity and that it had to be replaced by Mendelian genetics. It's also irrelevant that there was controversy as to whether natural selection was the single most important cause of evolution. All of this can be taken into account and still maintain the truth of the central claim that all we have is descent with modification due to natural causes. What does it mean for a process to be natural? I've been saying this many times and no doubt quite a few of you think that a lot of things hinge on it. Well, it simply means that these processes obey the laws of matter, of the matter around us, and that these laws must be accessible to us through experiment and standard logic, what we normally do. From this point of view, when we say that something is a natural process, we say that there's no room for miracles. And more importantly, even when you have chance events, the chance events must obey the statistical laws of randomness. For example, mutations will obey the Poisson distribution and things of that sort. What does it mean to be an explanation? Well, I am going to actually use a stronger notion of explanation that is strictly necessary. I am going to claim that an explanation is something that must allow prediction, but that correlations can also be allowed to, can, can allow predictions. So I am going to claim that the predictions must be made in such a way that they are based on causes that can be seen to be operating also in other contexts. That's a strong notion of explanation that I'm going to use, and I am going to claim that evolutionary theory satisfies that. So what is the evidence for evolutionary theory? First, there's the evidence for the fossil record. There's a lot of evidence, and there's no way I can go through even much of it in 15 minutes. I doubt I can go through most of it in 15 years. But, but let's have a start anyway. There's a fossil record. There must be consistency between radioactive dating results of the fossils themselves and the ambient strata in which they're found. There must be continuity of forms in the fossil record. There's evidence for morphology. Homology between structures due to common descent. That's for the why the whale that you see down there has the has the hip, hip bones, even though they are have no practical use to it. They can convert it evolution to occupy similar dishes to analogous structures. If you go to Australia, you'll find marsupials, which look very much like the placental mammals that we see around you today. There are empirical measurements of natural selection. By now there have been hundreds of experiments that have shown natural selection to work in the field. There are the facts of biogeography that cannot be explained by any other account. For example, if you look at that picture over there, the closest relatives of the camels of Eurasia are the Yamas of Latin America. And you wonder how those would have arisen, how continuity was going to be maintained. So you would like to see a continuous distribution. And indeed, when you go to North America today, or when you are in North America, it is the case that you don't see camels today, but you, see, you find fossil records of camels which were presumably the ancestors of both the Yamas in South America as well as the Camels of Eurasia. There's molecular data, there's consistency, and I'll say quite a few things about that in a second, between the results of molecular biology and what we claim to be the, the pattern of evolution as found in the fossil record. And lately, there have been lots and lots and lots of experiments on experimental evolution where we try to evolve desirable traits in order to design drugs and things of that kind. So I want to take just one of these and give a little bit of detail on this. That